warm welcome in the Savior's name. If Jesus was here in person, which he is by his spirit, then he'd say welcome. And uh, he'd also want to remind you that he did not come to be served, but to serve. So he wants to serve us tonight and minister to our hearts. I want to read from Philippians 2, verse 5 to 11, reminding us of our Lord's, yes, his humiliation, but then his exaltation to be king when he was crowned after the resurrection. So it's Philippians 2, verse 5 to 11. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but made himself nothing. Taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of man, being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Let's pray. <coughs> we would with the hymnist say holy, 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 all the saints adore thee, casting down their golden crowns around the glassy sea, cherubim and seraphim falling down before thee. You were and are and evermore shall be. You are the eternal God, and we bow before your throne and worship you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We thank you that we can join with all heaven and all the saints and angels and bring you our praise. But it is our longing that you would serve us, that you would grant to us grace upon grace, and that we would know you better. We would go out into the world to make you known in a more courageous way. We ask, O oh God, that your spirit would reveal the things of Jesus Christ to us this evening. Grant us joy in your presence. We ask through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Saviour. Amen. Our main reading this evening then is from Psalm 8. The Psalm of David. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens, out of the mouth of babies and infants. You have established strength because of your foes to still the enemy and the avenger. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him, and the son of man that you care for him? Yet you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings, and crowned him with glory and honor. You have given him dominion over the work of your hands. You have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens, and the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the seas. O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Thank him for his precious word. We'll look at that psalm a little bit later on, whatever you think of uh, creation, how beautiful it is, uh, whatever wonderful relationships you have 
They're all eclipsed, aren't they, by our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, let's bring up petitions to our God in prayer. Let's join together. It is true, Lord, that we love many things in this world because you've created them. We love all that you have made, though we have spoiled it, we confess. We're delighted with many of our relationships because they're from you. You said it's not good for man to be alone, and you've given to us companions and fellowship, brothers and sisters in Christ now. But it, it, it is from our heart that we want to say that you, oh God, are altogether lovely. We love you, Lord Jesus, because you first loved us. You've shed abroad the love of God in our hearts. We come this evening to say thank you that, and that we adore you. We want to know you better. We want to love you more than this world, more than our families more than anything. Thank you that we can come with our prayers to a God who cares for us, a God who <coughs> wants what is good for us. So we, we ask that you'd help us to pray according to your will. We know it's your will, Lord, to look after this world. Pray that we will be wise in the way that we Look after our resources, the things that you've given to us, which belong to you anyway. We alone them. Help us then, Lord, to be wise in the way we spend our money, make our investments, the way we give. May we give generously to those who are in need, and certainly for the work of the Lord. Pray that you would help us as we speak about these things to people in the world who just don't look beyond this world and think that this world is all there is, and they're passionate about it. So grant us to be wise in the way we speak about these things, to be full of light and truth as we talk about your world. I want to pray for the work of the gospel in this world, which we know is far more important than anything else. We pray, O oh Lord, that you would be with your servants wherever they are in the world, preaching the gospel, some suffering, hardship, and persecution. Grant them courage, Lord, that they would see beyond the hardships of this world, that they are working for them an eternal weight of glory. I want to pray particularly tonight for the land of Turkey, coming to the end of their elections, and we know how crucial it is who is to be the leader of that land, whether it becomes more hardened in its Islam or becomes more liberal and open to perhaps missionaries and contact with the West. Oh, Lord, then we, we pray for the, those people in the darkness of Islam. We pray that you bring light to their souls. Lord, we pray for our own people, our own church here. Ask that you be near to those who are in any trouble in any distress or suffering bodily. We pray that you'd grant to them relief and hope and joy in their own relationship with you. And that knowledge and confidence that you are working together, all things for good, for those who love you and are called according to your purpose. Lord, as we look to our immediate future as a church, again, we pray for strength and for patience, forbearance with one another, guidance as to the details of our move. Lord, you know our hearts, you know what we really want. We want your gospel to flourish here in Obi. Pray then, 
whatever our own personal preferences that you would unite us together around the gospel, <laughs> around the love of our dear Saviour. Pray then that tonight as we look at this psalm, you'd open our eyes to behold wondrous things from your law, that you'd forgive us our lack of faith, the sins that are obvious to us, Forgive us those sins which are only obvious to you, perhaps not to ourselves. Thank you for our Saviour, who washes away all our sins because of his shed blood on the cross. It's to him, our risen King, we draw near now. Pray that by his Spirit, he will be amongst us and bless us as we continue to worship. We ask in his wonderful name. Amen. So I hope you have um, a Bible with you. If not, there are some that could uh, be passed to you. Put your hand up and somebody will bring a Bible for you, or it may be even on your phone, which is fine. I don't know whether you enjoyed the um, pictures coming from London at the weekend about the coronation. I hope you're not fed up with thinking about it. Um, during the king's coronation, there were times when I thought Charles looked a bit shell-shocked, yeah. uh, as if he was rather overwhelmed by it all, to finally be crowned king of the United Kingdom and Commonwealth and all that that means. For me, the, the most poignant moment was when he was standing in front of the throne and his cloak was removed, and he just stood there, bareheaded, in a simple shirt, saying, it's just a man like us. Then came the crowning. After being anointed with oil, he was bedecked with royal robes, and that magnificent heavy crown was placed precariously on his head. The vibrant and glittering golden jewels that shone out meant, I think, to symbolize the weighty glory and honor invested in him as king. What a privilege was his, but what a responsibility as well. And King David, who wrote our song, I think often thought about the privilege and responsibility of being king, how God had taken him from being a shepherd boy in Bethlehem to being crowned king of Israel. But who is David actually referring to when he says in Psalm 8 verse 5, yet you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. Well, it includes David, obviously, but in the first place, though not the primary or the most important place, the, the hymn in that text is talking about mankind. It's talking about human beings descended from one man, Adam. They have been crowned. So what is, I want us to think about what it means to be crowned, and I've got four points. And firstly, I think David is thinking this. What an honor. That's what he's thinking. What an honor. Now, we'll look at how God has honored man in a minute, but any honor is amazing when the psalmist thinks about the one who is doing the honoring. That is, God, the uh, English Standard Version recognizes that by using the little word, yet, that refers back to King David's words in verse 3 to 4. It matters who is giving the honor. I don't know who the Lord Lieutenant of Leicester is. I'm sure he's a, a fine, upstanding man or even woman. Um, but, you know, if you're going to get your OBE, I think I'd rather have it from the king himself, wouldn't you? Well, what did David think about this honor? Well, he was thinking that it's from God. 
Um, we don't know when David wrote the psalm. Um, Charles Spurgeon refers to the psalm as the song of the astronomer. So is he perhaps sitting out on a rooftop balcony, looking up at the stars one night, and, and in those days there was no atmospheric pollution, no light pollution. In those days you could go out at night and see the stars so clearly. So he says in verse 3, when I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have set in place. Wow, any honor I receive from such a God is amazing. Doesn't tell us in these verses exactly how God made the heavens and how he set them in place. He didn't just fling them into space as one song puts it. And he didn't just oversee the process of creation, he was intimately involved in it, as if his fingers were deftly and carefully at work in every detail. And King David is thinking, this God made me as well. I don't know whether you've ever seen um, a reproduction or even seen the real thing, the artist Michelangelo captured something of this in his painting called Creation. It's on the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel in Rome. And although David says creation is the work of God's fingers, of course God doesn't literally have fingers, but in Michelangelo's painting, he does. And in, in the picture, God reaches out his finger and man who, who's just been created reaches out his hand to him, but the fingers don't quite touch. And I think one of the things Michelangelo was saying in that painting is that God, who always existed, is separate from his creation. He's that great. So we don't believe in pantheism, that God is in everything, no. But also it's saying that we are not gods. We are not extensions of God. He doesn't need us. He didn't need to create us to make himself great. It says, you have set your glory above the heavens, above all creation. And yet, this God honors us. It says, you've made him a little lower than the heavenly beings, or other translations, angels. You'll notice that our English Standard Version has an alternative translation. God has honored mankind by making him a little lower than God. And this supports the Bible's teaching that God created men and women in his own image. To be like God, to know and to, to think and to be creative and to relate to each other and supremely to know God. So Adam and Eve walked with God and talked with God in the Garden of Eden. They had a relationship with God, and David is thinking, I know this God, and he knows me. What an honor. And he goes further in verse 4. When I think of who you are, O God, what is man that you are mindful of him, and the son of man that you care for him? What, what is man? We've heard this before, but uh, we're told a typical 70 kilogram man contains enough carbon to make 9,000 pencils, enough phosphorus to make 2,000 match heads, enough fat, please don't be offended, enough fat to make seven bars of soap, enough iron to make a two inch nail, enough water to fill a 10 gallon drum and a few other bits as well. And if you went out to buy these things, it might cost less than a few hundred pounds. And some scientists say that that's all we are, physical matter. To God, you see, we're worth infinitely more than that. We have a precious, never dying soul. And David says this God is, is mindful of us. He remembers us. We're going to see in a minute that instead of bringing God honor, we brought shame on God because of our sin. And of all people, David knew that. 
And yet in Psalm 103, David could say, as a father shows compassion for his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him, for he knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. So he's sympathetic towards us. And he still thinks about all men and women and boys and girls and is mindful of every single one of us. What an honor that is. And it says he cares for us. The word in the authorized version is quite lovely. It's just the word visit. When you, when you visit someone, it shows that you care about that person. When we were living in the United States when we were younger, we often used to hear this expression, I'd love to visit with you, or I'd love you to visit with us. And that simply meant that they care enough about you to want to spend time talking with you. So what an honor to be crowned with God's glory. My friend, if you look for your honor and esteem in the world, you will be bitterly disappointed. You can have a thousand Facebook friends and a million likes, but they can diss you in a, in a moment, in, in the click of a button. When Adam and Eve felt so ashamed that they disobeyed God's instructions and tried to hide from him, God pursued them. God appealed, where are you? It's because he is proud of his handiwork. Loves his own image in man, distorted though that has become. So he comes looking for us. Look, God still likes you. He does not like your sin. As we'll see, he's angry with your sin. He hates it when you try and avoid him and don't listen to him. But he wants to honor you. Isaiah 66, verse 2 says this. Thus says the Lord, heaven is my throne, and the earth is my footstool. All these things my hand has made, and so all these things came to be, declares the Lord. But this is the one to whom I will look, or the one I will esteem or honor. He who is humble and contrite and trembles at my word. <laughs> And that leads me to actually talk about the thing we need to be contrite about or sorry about. So what an honor. Secondly, I think David is thinking, what a shame. What a shame. Our crown of glory and honor has to put it mildly become tarnished. Think again of that painting which Michelangelo painted in the Sistine Chapel. Remember, God's fingers and a man's fingers don't quite meet. And I think he's thinking about the rift between God and man. For instead of listening to the creator of the universe, Adam and Eve listened to God's enemy, the serpent, who was the devil in disguise. We might say that Satan was attempting to avenge his own fall from heaven and, and bring dishonor to God. That's what Satan does. He, he loves to take things God deems good and honorable and twist them to try to make God look bad. So look at what the mess your precious people have made of this world. Shame on them. Shame on you, God. The devil, of course, is to blame. And also, we are to blame. Let's just take one example that David gives in this psalm, the honor which God has bestowed on human beings in verse 6 to 8. You have given him dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet. There's the honor again. God honored human beings with a sacred duty to be fruitful, multiply, and particularly to look after this world to be God's stewards and managers on his behalf, to make sure it remained fruitful. What a great honor that is and responsibility. King Charles, as we know, has been at the vanguard of warning us about the way we've been exploiting the earth's resources and spoiling it. Not the only one that's been saying that. Did you know the late former prime minister 
Margaret Thatcher, no less, said this. We do not hold a freehold on our world, but only a full repairing lease. She said that. We have a moral duty to look after our world and hand it on in good order to future generations. She's right. So is Prince Charles. So on the one hand, I think it's important that as Christians, we do not dismiss the concerns of those who only think about this world. So we mustn't say, oh, well, God is going to destroy the earth one day anyway. We're going to heaven. There'll be a new earth. No, no, Christians do need to show an example in the way we use the resources God has given to us and care for our planet and promote a just distribution of the earth's wealth. But on the other hand, we mustn't be railroaded into panic. Whilst we mustn't be climate change deniers, we surely concur with Isaac Watts' sentiment in his hymn. He said this, I sing the almighty power of God that made the mountains rise, that spread the flowing seas abroad, and built the lofty skies. It's not a plant or flower below, but makes his glories known. And clouds arise and tempests blow by order from his throne. Don't we believe that he's got the whole world in his hands? King Charles held a, a golden orb in his hand to symbolize that, that God is the sovereign king over all the earth. Christians are not anti-science. We believe God created the world to work according to scientific laws, but we must trust in God and not in scientists. Problems arise when scientists theorize but are short on proof, and then they speculate. And then they pontificate. So scientists have issued what they call a red alert. That unless we change our ways, the world is doomed. And future generations will never forgive us unless we do something. But I say this is the shame that our young people and older people believe that our future is in our hands. No. The shame goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden when we all in Adam turned away from God. God sounded the alarm then when because of man's rebellion, God cursed the ground. William Williams put it like this in his hymn. In Eden, sad indeed that day, my countless blessings fell away. My crown fell in disgrace. William Williams based his hymn on words written by Jeremiah in Lamentations 5. The crown has fallen from our head. Woe to us, for we have sinned. That's why the world is decaying. Because of our sin. So there we are. We've brought shame on ourselves and dishonored God. But the mercy is this. It doesn't have to be the end of our crown. It, it may be tarnished and in the dirt, but God hasn't given up on us. It would dishonor his own name if he were to write off mankind. And that's why the conclusion of the psalm repeats the opening refrain. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. We still bear God's image, distorted though it is. He still loves the world. He is determined that his glory will fill the earth as the waters cover the sea. And particularly through his redeemed people. And this is what gave Jeremiah hope at the end of that book of Lamentations. He prays. But you, O oh Lord, reign forever. Your throne endures to all generations. Restore us to yourself, O oh Lord, that we may be restored. Renew our days as of old. Unless you've utterly rejected us, you remain exceedingly angry with us. Well, he doesn't. 
And the reason is, and, and, and in order to be able to answer a prayer like that from Jeremiah, David asks us to consider thirdly, what a man. What an honor. What a shame. What a man. Verse 6 says, you put everything under his feet. Now, that may have been true for Adam, but as we've seen, it's certainly not true for Adam's seed. Everything isn't under our feet. The thorns in the ground are our enemies. Satan is our implacable enemy, and our worst enemy is our own stubborn will. But as John Henry Newman put it in his hymn, Praise to the Holiest in the Height, he said, Oh, loving wisdom of our God, when all was sin and shame, he, the last Adam, to the fight and to the rescue came. There's another man, and he visited us. Verse 2 is surely talking about him, isn't it? Out of the mouth of babies and infants, you have established strength, thought or praise, because of your foes, to still the enemy and the avenger. I'll prove it relates to him in a minute. But it is worth mentioning that some writers think that David has himself in mind here in verse 2. He's remembering sitting under the stars as a boy, looking after the sheep and feeling small when he thinks of God's majesty in the heavens. And then maybe he recalls his confrontation with Goliath, 1 Samuel 17. Goliath looked David over and saw that he was only a boy, ruddy and handsome, and he despised David. But then God turns David's apparent weakness into strength to rout the Philistine army, to silence Israel's foes. Remember what he said, I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. And verse 2 is actually quoted by our Lord Jesus Christ. It's Matthew 21, verse 16, implying that David was writing about him. Remember when Jesus was riding into Jerusalem on a donkey and enters the temple, overturns the table of the money changers, and, and the kids were shouting his praise, Hosanna to the son of David. They weren't a bit intimidated by the grim-faced Pharisees who were very indignant. Don't know if they have placards saying, not my king. <laughs> but the children were very happy to praise his name. Charles Spurgeon quotes from a letter of George Whitfield describing the persecution when he first started preaching in London. He says, several little boys and girls who were fond of sitting around me on the pulpit while I preached and handed to me people's notes, though they were often pelted with eggs and dirt thrown at me. Never once did they give way. On the contrary, every time I was struck, they turned up their little weeping eyes and seemed to wish they could receive the blows for me. Oh, God, make them in their growing years great and living witnesses for him who out of the mouths of babes and infants perfects praise. Is that how you feel about the Lord Jesus Christ when you read this psalm? What a man. The writer to the Hebrews then has no hesitation in applying it to him. Hebrews 2, verse 6 to 9, should eliminate any doubt that David was thinking about Jesus coming. Hebrews 2, 6. It has been testified somewhere. <laughs> he knew it was um, a psalm of David. He couldn't recall chapter and verse, which often I can't either. 
But it has been testified somewhere, he says, what is man? That you are mindful of him, or the son of man that you care for him. You made him a little lower than the angels. You've crowned him with glory and honor, putting everything in subjection under his feet. Now, in putting everything under his feet, he left nothing outside his control. At present, we do not yet see everything in subjection to him, but we see him who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. <coughs> there it is, God showed just how much he cared about us when he sent his son to visit us. He became a real man without ever ceasing to be God. He was thus made a little lower than the angels. Yeah, he wore a crown, but it was a crown of thorns and of humiliation. Of course, thorns represent the curse of the ground which he bore for us. And Hebrews 2 says he tasted death for everyone. That means he experienced it. He really died. But he died the death which you and I deserve. Bearing shame. And scoffing, rude. In my place condemned he stood. Sealed my pardon with his blood. And then you join him with those children. Hallelujah. Well, what a savior. Do you believe these things? William Williams, him I mentioned earlier, remember in Eden said, indeed that day my countless blessings fled away, my crown fell in disgrace, but he goes on, but on victorious Calvary, that crown was won again for me. My life shall all be praised. Faith, see the place, see the tree where heaven's prince instead of me was nailed to bear my shame, bruised was the dragon by the sun. Though two had wounds, there conquered one, and Jesus was his name. I don't know whether all of you are trusting in the sun. Maybe there's people watching on the video who don't yet no, that assurance of trusting in God for your salvation. You need to bow the knee to Jesus. You need to kiss the Son. You need to say you're sorry for your past redemption, rebellion. But then thank him for his redemption, dying for your sins. So he wants to clothe you with his royal robes. He wants to put a crown of honor on your head. He wants to free you from bondage to sin. So if you've never yet put your faith in Christ alone, you could pray something like this, but use your own words. Out of my shameful failure and loss, Jesus, I come. Into the glorious gain of the cross, Jesus, I come to you. Or you could simply fall on your knees and say, your majesty, your majesty. Fourthly then, there's going to be a crowning. And so I call this, what a prospect. So what an honor, what a shame, what a man. But what a prospect. Jesus was only made a little lower than the heavenly beings for a time. Jesus rose from the dead. He was crowned with a new glory and honor as the God-man. We read in Philippians, therefore God exalted him to the highest place and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. That happened when he ascended. You know, when Queen Elizabeth died, King Charles immediately became king. It's interesting that not only is it called his accession to the crown, to the throne, it's also called his ascension to 
the throne. So there is now a man in heaven ruling the earth, conquering dominions, bringing many sons to glory, seizing back from Satan all things that rightfully belong to God until the day when everything that will belong to him and he'll fill the whole universe. And in the meantime, we have the honor of serving him now as our king. Christ, says John Newton, has taken our nature into heaven to represent us and left us on earth with his nature to represent him. And Isaiah really accords with that. He says in Isaiah 62 about us, you will be a crown of beauty in the Lord's hand, the royal diadem in the hand of your God. So the prospect over these next few, however many years God gives us, is that we, we can serve God with gladness as our king. You see, when God has honored you with his mercy and love, and you know your soul is safe, you have a whole new mindset, don't you? You, you, you don't just think about this world. We want verse 9 of our psalm to be fully true. Oh, Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth, in all the peoples. You'll want to serve him wherever he sends you. You'll want him to be glorified and honoured. Apparently, when the missionary Henry Martin was working amongst Muslim people in Persia, he saw a drawing of Christ catching hold of Muhammad's garments, and Christ was bowing to Muhammad. And somebody asked him why he was so distressed and in tears. And Henry Martin said this, I could not endure existence if Jesus were not to be glorified. It would be hell to me if he were always thus to be dishonored. That's what motivates us then, isn't it? Christ's honor and glory as we serve him in this world. But we do know we have a long-term prospect that's wonderful. One day, King Jesus is going to be publicly crowned and universally acclaimed. That's in Philippians 2 again, at the name of Jesus. Every knee shall bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. One day, we are going to rule in the new creation with him, his co-heirs. We'll look after the new world properly and efficiently and righteously. There's also the prospect that all his people will receive crowns and honors as well. And Paul could say, I fought the good fight to Timothy. I have finished the race, I've kept the faith. Now there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, not only to me, but also to all who've loved his appearing. Peter calls it the crown of glory. James calls it the crown of life. That's the prospect. But do you know to me what is the most thrilling prospect? It is seeing Jesus and giving him the glory. Receiving our crown and honor will be like, I don't know, a, a winning athlete who's just run a race. He, he's just received his trophy. The camera then zooms in on him or her, and they're giving an interview. And they say that this trophy really belongs to my coach. To my parents who got up with me at five o'clock in the morning and took me swimming. I couldn't have done anything without them. And isn't that just what John saw happening in heaven? 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. And it says they cast their crowns before the throne, saying, you are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and praise, for you created all things. 
and by your will they existed and have their being. What a prospect that is for us, isn't it? If we're his children tonight. And so, all within me cries out in praise, your majesty, I can but bow. I lay my all before you now in royal robes I don't deserve. I live to serve your majesty. King of kings and Lord of lords. Why don't we just spend just a few seconds just bowing again before him, saying thank you for such an honor such a man, a God-man in Christ Jesus for a wonderful prospect. And if you don't know that yet yourself, well, ask him to receive you as his child. He wants you to come to him. He cares for you. Amen. Shall we share together the benediction in Corinthians? May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Amen.